Hey everyone, this podcast is part of Story Mode, the podcast network of Gamefully Unemployed. You can support us and gain access to other great exclusive podcasts at patreon.com slash gamefully unemployed. That's patreon.com slash G-A-M-E-F-U-L-L-Y unemployed, which is spelled like it sounds. It's all the words we don't say about the empty man. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> the one jazz joke I know. <laughs> yeah, it's about it's the notes the you don't play. Joke. It's the only jazz joke, Because I've never right? heard a jazz song, and I don't, know, I don't know how it works. I just hear jazz people saying it's about the notes you don't play. There, right. was, there was like a one-year period when my dad moved to Miami for the Navy where he just listened to jazz all the time. Like, it was just... It, huh. all, of, all of a sudden, he became a jazz guy for, like, 1996, and that was it. <laughs> like, after 1996, that phase passed. But. And he was just like, this is stupid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, oh, God, what was I doing? Changes all his presets. <laughs> it just goes car. on and on. They're just, yeah. they're just Is this the same song we've listened to the radio for three hours? <laughs> um, hi, hi, everybody. Hello, everyone. <laughs> My name is David Bell. My name is Tom Ryman. I am Jason Pargin. Hi, welcome. And we and we just watched The Empty Man. Sempty Man. Yeah. Y'all know The Empty Man. The Everybody empty loves man. The Empty Man. Yeah. Hey, wait. We gotta try it. Try what? Calling The Empty Man. Who's The Empty Man? If you're on a bridge... And you find a bottle, you blow into it, and you think about the empty man. Oh, come on, Mandy, how old are you? Tell him the rest. On the first night, you hear him. And on the second night, you see him. And on the third night? Well, on the third night, he finds you. You can hear him, can't you? Squirming his way into your thoughts. Like a disease. And his message is contagious. Jason, welcome. Hi. Uh, How's thanks it going? for being on. Yeah. Uh, you brought this to us. This so- film. There is all of a sudden a bunch of buzz about this movie. Not yes. not buzz, not like uh hey this this terrible not like the room, like this this terrible movie you've got to see it, which is what you're going to think if any of you pause this podcast to go watch the trailer to The Empty Man, you think, "Oh, we're about to make fun of this movie. It's one of those bad teen slashers yeah. where they summon an urban legend." by blowing in a bottle at right. night right. and then they get picked off one by one and then a detective tries to stop it and then they in the end they have to fight the empty man uh so there is for some reason like people now are talking about this movie the yes. history behind how this movie got made and how it wound up in front of us is fascinating I want to note this yeah. movie has a 53% on Rotten Tomatoes and yes. a 39% with audiences. This is a very divisive uh, movie, but yeah, I really am interested to hear about this because Jason, when you sent us the email asking if we wanted to do this episode, like no joke, three other people that day had told me about The Empty Man. Uh, right. And this this movie came out last, like, January of October. 2020. Oh. It, oct- it, it was released theatrically October okay. 23rd. Uh, nobody saw it because you know that word theatrically yeah. in there, uh, and and so it just sort of limped out. And yeah. I, I had like sort of seen the um, poster, but yeah, Jason, I had the reaction that yeah, that you're describing, where it's like I thought this was like the Bye Bye Man. This was mm-hmm. like yeah, uh, or Slender Man movie so where it's, it's like it's urban a, legend, supernatural slasher. It's a real doozy when you watch that trailer. Like if you go to like Amazon, you search for it uh, and you watch the trailer to see what it is, and it looks like you know the Bye Bye Man or Slender Man, and then you look down at the movie's runtime and it's two hours and twenty minutes. Like that's yeah, that's <laughs> enough to make you never consider this movie again. Right. Uh, <laughs> this is such a, an object lesson in how bad modern streaming platforms are at recommending content. Because I have watched every 
and this is just my description right now is a slight spoiler. We will be spoiling throughout here. If you really want to see this unspoiled, uh, to pause the podcast and go do it now. Yeah. But I have watched every Lovecraftian horror thing on Amazon's entire platform. I, you know, I watched the Nick Cage uh, adaptation of Color Out of Color Space. Out of Space, yeah. And all of these, you know, we've, we've been on here, to, to I think, to talk about other movies like it that have come and gone. This movie... You know, I, I go on Amazon Prime every week. I go on Netflix every week, like a lot of people, just looking, see, seeing what new has popped up. And this yep. never popped up in recommendations and even just their list of new releases where they will just dump every oddball thing, uh, movies from 1986. It's, it's the Tom Hanks hit, The Man with One Red Shoe. Right. They just dump as a, as a new release because, well, we I, just bought it. Real quick, real quick. I used to conflate that with my left foot in my mind. <laughs> two like, very different movies. Yeah, two, but I thought they were like the movies. same movie. Like the Tom Hanks movie is about him. He can only communicate with his foot. Anyway. <laughs> so I never saw this. Even now that there's buzz about it, went, had to, the only way I found it was by searching for the title and then found it like deep among other things with similar titles. Like Amazon in a period when they should have been starving for content. To feed to people in this desert of new releases. Here's this movie, a very slick horror movie that you know looks very good. It's got a niche audience. You would think it popped up in their streaming service back in January. You would think they would throw it up there because it's like, what else do we have to give these people? It's right. It's a drought. It's a content drought. So the me even this you know I have written in this genre or or stupid versions of this genre. That Amazon didn't know to tell me this movie was out for rent or purchase kind of says it all. It, I think the studio was didn't understand it because yes, yeah. This this movie is it's the first time director he uh, what's his name uh, David Pryor mm-hmm. he he had uh, been doing uh, making of documentaries. If you look them up, it's all mainly Fincher movies. Uh, Making like of DVD Zodiac, extras. Making of Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. They're like that, shorts and DVD extras and stuff yeah. for those movies. Yeah. He was also the editor of those. Like, he clearly was like this one man uh, thing that they would just stick behind the scenes of movies. Uh, he, this is his, yeah, it's his debut film. And it's not, like we're started hinting at, it's not really a slasher film that it advertises Mm-mm. as. It reminds me of one of those movies where they don't know quite how to advertise it because it doesn't. Ex- fit perfectly into one genre yeah it is it's it's like a hat on a hat on a hat which isn't a lot of times is a bad thing in this case i would say we haven't talked we usually uh, at the top of this say whether or not we enjoyed it i enjoyed this movie yeah no i really liked it yeah because it's it's weird and complex and it, it goes yeah places. and it does but that thing like, oh go ahead real, i'll let you, f- oh, you finish you finish it's just it's lovecraftian as we mentioned mm-hmm. it's it's uh it's a mystery it's a cult film it is also kind of a supernatural slasher at times a little bit yeah it's it's a, a lot of things so I could see the studio just being kind of terrified of it. Right. They lean into, you get a couple of glimpses of this figure. So they, the preview really lean into, uh, you blow in a bottle and then this guy comes and kills you. And that's not really what this movie is about. No. Um, but it, it does a thing that I know, uh, Jason, you've mentioned before where it this movie doesn't fully explain itself. Like it doesn't explain what the horror is really like we know enough about it by the end to kind of understand how it works but we don't know anything else about it and we like a lot of modern horror tends to be afraid to do that like but the unknown is like a completely legitimate thing for a device for horror you don't have to explain um or like overly explain uh, something for it to be scary. It's sometimes it's scarier when you don't really quite understand everything about it. Absolutely. Um, and that's a, a lot of where Lovecraftian horror operates in. Like that's kind of the base idea is that he's talking about stuff that your mind can't comprehend. Uh, so this movie does it really well, I think. And I, I really liked that it could have 
given us a really s- dumb, cheesy explanation of like the rules of this entity, blah, blah, blah. But it, it doesn't do that. Like it, it resists the urge to do that. And I'm sure you, you, if this movie had like a bigger budget, the director probably would have had a lot of pressure to do something like that. Like, no, this doesn't, we need this to fit more neatly into a category. Could you maybe make it more about a boogeyman that has clear rules? And it's like, no, that's not what this movie is. Um, it also yeah. plays into why I think it doesn't get great reviews because I'm I'm looking at some of the audience reviews and it's mostly people are just like this is boring this is boring because they they were expecting a certain type of movie and they didn't get it and that is important because like this movie I watched in the morning I was kind of half asleep I was drinking caffeine and I really enjoyed it as like kind of a chill movie uh, for the reason that it's like it's I wouldn't call it a slow burn but it's. I would, uh, I would call it yeah, a slow Yeah, I guess it is kind of a slow burn, yeah. It's a steady build to the mystery, and you don't really have all the pieces until the very end. Yeah, and I think a lot of the reviews kind of seem to consider it a failure uh, for the reason that I think people had specific expectations on it right. of what kind of genre they were going in to see. Like the trailer is pushing like Freddy Krueger, and that's not what this is. Yeah. Right that what you mentioned about the length is important horror especially slasher horror is usually short yeah um because there's not yeah there's not a ton of steps to go through you know you've got the whatever origin of the killer he shows up on the scene you you meet your group of teens or whoever are going to be the victims they get picked off one by one and then you get down to a final person usually a final girl and she either kills him or else you you get the twist where the bad guy wins or he, he, whatever. And that's pretty much it. This movie is structured in a very interesting way in that for the first hour, it kind of does look like it's just, oh, a bunch of teens summoned an urban legend slasher and he's picking them off one by one and this detective's got to look into it. <laughs> what happens that, is... That twist, I know you're about to say it, but that twist at like the one hour mark, I was like, okay, I have no idea where this movie is going uh, Yeah. <laughs> At about one hour into it, this detective keeps looking, and instead of finding, oh, here's how you summon the empty man, and you can only kill him with blank. (laughs) He's angry because he was unfairly executed by the by hanging a hundred years ago blowing and, bottles at him yeah blowing bottles and the only way you can <laughs> defeat him is by un, by sucking into a bottle it, it's instead he, he found he, he finds himself going down a rabbit hole and you see the movie yeah. has played a trick on you and that the bye bye man that whole urban legend the whole thing was just like a side effect of what's really going on and he yes. dives into this maze this kind of a noir the thriller where it's, it's this gumshoe he's a private eye and he's going around and trying to and he, he stumbles into this cult and, and he starts having hallucinations and things keep getting weirder and weirder and then you get an ending that the movie we'll talk about this in a moment because the whole concept of like how to pull off twists and horror and it shouldn't be too much of a spoiler even if you want to stop now to say it has a twist because this type of movie obviously has a twist when you start watching it is that the conclusion is, well, wouldn't it be the scariest thing of all if he kind of never figures it out all the way? To where most audience members will say, no, I hate that. Right. (laughs) I want closure as to what happened. But the whole point they keep bringing it back to is like nothing is real. Nothing you can trust you're seeing is real. You can't rely on anything. And then in the final minutes, like everything he thought he knew kind of falls apart. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and that's like, this is, there's no happy ending. He doesn't solve the problem. Nothing is fixed. He, he just finally fell down the exact thing that they said would happen to him. You're eventually, you are going to be one of the, the empty people. The, you will be the empty man because you will find you that there is actually nothing to the universe. It's all nonsense. Yeah. Uh, the, the switch I was talking about is this movie this man it even has like a 22 minute prologue before the opening credits roll where it's like a different movie that prologue was the first uh, like it's funny that like i went into this sitting down i didn't watch the trailer i i had heard what you had said jason and i'd read 
synopsis and i actually like paused the movie and had to make sure i had like found the right film because of that opening Mm -hmm. uh and that opening really like it 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 made me it prepared me for like an unconventional film yeah for sure it's 20 minutes you think like oh is this the movie uh, and then it just ends, and you know that has to do with something. Mm-hmm. And I think this movie does a really good job at not answering the questions, but you kind of get the idea. You see, it shows you the links, but doesn't explain them. Yeah, it shows the 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 equivalent of the bottle. This uh, the little like, reed instrument that the guy. Fi- it's like a bunch of the pe- guy it's, finds, it's for yeah. for college age kids backpacking in the 90s. through nepal in 1995 one of them falls into a crevice in front of this like 10 foot tall mummy with crazy ass spider arms right and so that's again that's all you kind of need you're like all right it's some crazy yeah, yeah, like yeah. and then old god or something yeah it's that's... something it's one of the great old ones yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh it, it ends up infecting one of them who passes the infection to somebody else and she ends up killing the other two and herself uh did you guys notice that the 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 guy she stabs and pushes over the cliff is the guy that gets cut in half and bone tomahawk really yep (laughs) (laughs) that is the that is deputy nick from bone that that guy's having a hard time he does not have the best luck in movies that i've seen his acting reel is just various ways he's been like impaled on things (laughs) various ways he's been murdered on screen a a thresher and (laughs) they also it, it's important to note that they they phrase it as day one, day two, day three. Yeah, it's, during it's, this part. Yeah, um, it looks like it. In, at the moment, it looks like she just kills them, and like clearly she's possessed or something. They later show that there's this entity that's they, killing them, and they it, they it, do. Like, just real quick, they do make it clear that she is like doing it at his behest. Like it, it it's clear yes. that he's communicating to her somehow. Because she she kills the two of them and then looks to him for further stuff and he right. he's has a like vessel. a single tear and he's just whispering gibberish and then she jumps off the mountain so yeah yeah but um, like later when that girl uh, dies in the sauna and stuff they show that it's like I want her, t- <laughs> her perspective is she's being murdered and the reality is it's, she's that killing was, herself that was hardcore oh, <laughs> that, was yeah. a, that was a real good effect with she stabs herself in the face a billion times with a pair of scissors and they do like this they make like her cornea float they do this effect it's very effective oh yeah um yeah. this is I a very well made movie in general yes. yes like the way it's shot like this is the first time director or at least first time feature director it, it's mm-hmm. it looks great that's actually most of what you can the whole issue if you watch a lot of horror and you consume a lot of horror there are movies where it kind of seems like they cared and some where it seems uh-huh. like maybe yeah. not as much this is a movie uh, this and we'll get into like the background of how this got made in a bit but this guy he cared about this movie and and it's it's lovingly made and it's yeah you know, it's very and there's this, a lot of the, very effective sequences yeah the fact that this guy edited a lot too shows makes a lot because, of sense yeah yeah the slow burn elements in this are it's i it's hard to say it's it, almost a parody but not it's not like tongue in cheek it's not funny it's just he knows how slow burn works yes and he knows how the sound should work and stuff so like mm-hmm. when when the text comes on screen this is day one day two day three like the sound is so ominous um yeah the sounds in general are very the ominous sound design in this. in this movie is very good yeah yeah just the, and, the rapid footsteps yeah to the mm. point that it would make me giggle because of how on the nose it was but it didn't need to not be yeah he wasn't trying to do he you know he wasn't trying to do something uh brand new because he knew this is what we needed uh for yeah. those moments and it worked you, you mentioning that he did a lot of work with fincher makes sense yeah oh um, yeah and uh wh- the 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 big twist for me that i wanted to to bring up was you know it starts out with his neighbor his neighbor's teenage girl goes missing he's looking for her he starts questioning her friends they don't know what happened he can't find the rest of the friends that were with her the night they summon the empty man so like jason mentioned it seems like it's gonna be about these teens who summon this guy but like like 20 minutes into his investigation he finds every single one of them hanging dead underneath yeah. the bridge so they're like oh okay i guess that's oh, not what are. this movie's gonna be 
in a in a sequence that is setting up that he's calling the empty man because he finds the bottle on the uh yeah and so you think that's what that sequ- sequence is for and then he finds their bodies and you're like oh shit yeah uh, so you kind of your guard is let down you think like he hears a noise mm-hmm. and so he goes down in this like below the bridge and you think oh this is going to be the first jump scare moment and it kind of is but the thing that yeah it kind of throws a wrench into what he's been up to yeah that's interesting there's a couple of scenes like this where he's hearing a noise and the way the movie is presented and the way that like movies like this have trained us to think you assume it's like the empty man or whatever the entity creeping around just out of you but in every instance it's something much more mundane but like way scarier like in this in this sequence he hears like a tapping and it's one of the dead kids shoes hitting in the pipe And then later in the Institute, he hears a tapping when they're like summoning somebody. And it turns out it's he was hearing himself tapping his wedding ring. Yeah. Yeah. Hearing him a second version of a second version of himself. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) This movie is wild. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But I'm I'm sorry. Go on. Well, that's true to the kind of Lovecraftian. You like you've gone down the tunnel of madness type yeah thing. like that sequence is a great example of it is of like where the the narrator is losing the plot uh that's there there are yeah. several bits like that where it's uh where there's and I, I don't want to spoil too many like individual moments because again i would hope that no one is listening to this instead of watching the movie i i very much want people to watch the movie i want it to be successful i want more movies like this to get made but like there's a point where he finds like a creepy old teddy bear in yeah. an, like an abandoned place. And then it shows up like at his, his house, which again is kind of a, a cliche horror thing. And then later he finds in his home, like the receipt for the teddy bear would have been ordered off Amazon. Yeah. Uh, there's like, what, what? It's like, no, you're, you're never going to find out. It's, we're nope. never going to come back to that. It's, yeah, it's, it's, they, they, they throw a couple of things in there to let us know that, he's a he is an unreliable narrator <laughs> so, like by the end of the movie you're just like i don't know what the fuck is real anymore yeah. in this movie. which again will frustrate many viewers see you, you'll, you'll get probably poor to middling user scores yeah. all, all over the place on this for that reason i know a lot of people don't like you know ambiguity i get it Re- real life is full of ambiguity you watch a movie to not have that <laughs> I, yeah. I understand yeah. Yeah. but this, it compa- is deliberate it is you're following somebody down a a, a hole of madness in, into a dark place where he doesn't. And, and that's it. He, you only have the narrator to tell you what's going on or this guy's POV. Right. Mm-hmm. And his POV is breaking down. And that's, that's, that's the, the there's a whole genre of horror like that. That's not a mistake. It's just, it, it's not common. And in the way, and there's a, an interview with the David Pryor, the, the writer director that I'll talk about later where it's like the difference between horror for teens and horror for adults. Like horror for teens is standard slasher movie. It's very, you know, a few spectacular kills and then final, like it's very formulaic. Where horror for adults, you have something more like hereditary or get out where it's a little bit longer and there's a little bit more to it and there's more layers. They, like there's usually some, there's deeper stuff about the family or about society or some issue. Like there's just a little bit more to chew on as he put it. Yeah, it's preying on a lot more adult fears which are often a lot more like uh uh like surreal and nuanced existential like when you're when you're a teenager you still think you're gonna live forever so like the scariest thing you can imagine is some dude hit killing you with an axe you know yeah exactly um but yeah when you get older it's just way more it's like oh there's worse things yeah yeah I'm, I'm worried the, um, about like the fucking universe and shit. Yeah. A movie I would compare this to, not in style, but I think because this uh surprisingly is a movie that also didn't get good reviews, uh In the Mouth of Madness. The John Carpenter mm-hmm. basically <laughs> doing Lovecraft. Doing Lovecraft, yeah. And it's another ending where you're like, the fuck was that? You know? <laughs> it's a great ending. <laughs> it's a great ending. It's such a good ending. But it's the same idea of like unreliable yeah, narrator. Just, what is reality? Yeah, uh, and, and that, some. I think it's that's that's one that if you look at reviews, it's pretty like split down the middle. 
And it's the same thing. It's just like, no, I just want the monsters to and, be real or like yeah. to make sense. Oh, the monsters <laughs> are real. It's just... Yeah. Yeah, another one I think it bombed so hard that people probably got fired, if I remember correctly. But yet, we remember that movie and have totally forgotten probably most of the movies that came out whatever year In the Mouth of Madness came out. Like, it has lasted. I think. Yeah, like, it has remained in the consciousness much longer than many other, like, probably. Yeah, than, like, The Shadow, which also came out uh, that year. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like, very profitable, what they thought of as as hit movies at the time that have been completely forgotten. But you can still watch, you know, YouTube breakdowns of In the Mouth of Madness and people recommending it. Like, it has stuck around uh, for, for that reason, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. Looking at it, has a good audience score for this reason. I think still not as good as as high as you'd uh, assume, but yeah, it. It's interesting. I'm just looking at the poster. Um, going down a hole is definitely the motif they're going for. Like it, it just occurred to me. Like it begins with a guy falling into a hole. Oh, for the <laughs> empty man, yeah. And then in the poster for the empty man, the T is elongated down so that it's just like this pit, and you can see the little guy down there at the bottom. It's like, oh, okay, they're really they're they're telling us. Okay, if <laughs> it's right there, they oh they are. But at the I I do think the poster uh, there's some marketing issues here because I yes. think the poster it does look like the bye bye man uh, kind of yeah it's, in in its own way like this the text is sim- similar yeah. Uh, it's and it's got a figure like the bye bye man is uh, a guy like it's I, I assume the bye bye man standing there and it says the bye bye man over him mm-hmm. so it's like the same basic uh, like the guy is littler in in the empty man poster well I think but the I guy, can see looking at it and thinking the same yeah yeah for it's sure and it does have like the 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 only rules we get. Uh, are on the poster at the top and it's basically the same rules as uh, drag me to hell right it's like the also, haunting gets progressively worse over three days until you're fucked on the last day yeah or the Slender ring Man poster. Or... yeah 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 the ring yeah slender man poster is also the same just for the record Oof. it's <laughs> it's scrawling slender man yeah have uh, um jason have you seen slender Did man or the bye bye man, man? I have probably, there's probably none of these that I have not seen. It's just sometimes they're on in the background while I'm working right. because it's like, I, I can glance at it once every 15 minutes and know where I'm at in the movie because I've yeah. <laughs> I've seen yeah. this movie before, even if I've not seen uh, this movie before. If, you know, it's like, okay, well, here's, yeah, we're 59 yeah, right. minutes into the movie. Here's where she finds her mother has been killed by whatever. And, uh, you know, this is one of those things with horror. Um, it's how I like discovered Lake Mungo. Although I think I saw that recommended somewhere. Is yeah, horror that's like on the like most unreliable? Yeah, the most unreliable thing of horror is the posters, right? Because yes. they all look the goddamn same. Yeah, they're all, and it's yeah. so hard to figure out what uh, which ones good and which ones aren't. I would mm-hmm. like to talk about. Hey, let me. I like to go into the background of this a little bit because the, the market yeah. materials. David Pryor, the guy who made this movie, he did not see the poster or the trailer or any of that until they were live. So Damn. yeah, that's that's a hell of a thing. <laughs> until that's they were out problem. in the public. So here's what here's exactly what happened. And if you if you're saying like you said earlier that you thought the studio didn't know what to do with it, um, the studio that owns this movie is a, it's a company called Disney. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Sure is. So if it seems Heard like it. if you're yeah. wondering how maybe their machinery didn't know how to handle the empty man. So <laughs> this is, this is if you go look it up, you'll see it's based on a graphic novel series. It is very loosely based. Um, also called the empty man. If you go out and look for it, it's actually the first issue is available for free. Not not stolen, but like the the studios have made it like they released for free as a promotional thing. It is basically the movie takes place in that same universe, but does not borrow any of the same characters, events, and anything. The main, and it it never, basically that graphic novel series, this takes place years later after The Empty Man, is basically that cult has started taking over the world. And it's about a government agencies like trying to stop it before it gets, it's, it's basically treated as like an epidemic. Wow. Um, so they made this, and this guy, David Pryor, I don't know how he got hold of the story, but he wanted to make one 
like it would be a very big budget thing to make the graphic novel because it's like a worldwide almost like a zombie type story where he wanted to make a smaller one that was basically go back to the origins of the empty man and how this all started so he basically wrote a new story in that universe he pitched this to 20th century fox back in 2016 Oof. and maybe being friends with david fincher helped but they went ahead and they you know they got it made on a budget of like four million dollars which is pretty good for a movie like like this you can you can do quite a bit without amount of money um and then they started shooting uh in fall of 2016 and then everything started going to hell there was they were supposed to shoot in cape down cape town south africa and then the rest was supposed to shoot in chicago for the parts that because it all takes place in like st louis something like that yeah yep yeah it's in missouri um, they went to Chicago. It, they, there was a blizzard in Chicago when they were supposed to shoot. They wound up delaying shooting until April. And then the worst thing that can happen happened. The executive who bought the movie at 20th Century Fox was fired. Oof. So yep. that's this very is something bad. That's that, bad. <laughs> that people don't out there, if you're not in the business, you know, friends in the business or you're not kind of follow this kind of story. It's easy. You don't understand. The authors have the same thing. You'll have an editor at the publisher who liked your story. If that editor leaves, your book can become an orphan, as they say in the biz, because the the person who paid you that advance and liked your book is gone and no one else there cares about it or will even read it, knows what it is. And the person who was going to get it released and, and get the push and all that is gone. Well, that's what happened to this guy. They were in the middle of shooting this movie. They had mostly shot it. And then um, their one executive was let go, and they didn't have a, a a champion at the time. So meanwhile, Fox is, unbeknownst to this guy and to the rest of the world, is about to be swallowed up by Disney. And so there are people there like trying to figure out, it's a situation we have been in the past, like, am I still going to have a job when this new company takes over? You know, should right. we all leave? Should we go find something better? Go start our own studio or whatever. So meanwhile, this guy, this poor guy has just got like all this film he's shot and is now trying to make, turn it into a movie because that's the longest part of the process, doing the effects work, doing, you got to go through all the storyboard stuff to get the, the effects stuff done and then edit what you've, what you've uh, shot. And then he said like that next year, I think somewhere like in, oh, 2018 they suddenly get this call like okay that movie that you've kind of been been that we've all forgotten about you have to finish it right now we need it right now (laughs) they found some slot to fill yep uh yeah it's terrible because he's like this little fish in the ocean at this point where it's it's like to everybody else yeah like what jason's saying once your advocate is gone to everybody else at that studio you're just a line on a spreadsheet well and your cost you're yeah, sunk you're cost. Like, this is a four million dollar cost on our budget what is this so someone totally unfamiliar with <clears throat> his movie the same as if like let's hypothetically say that back years ago like if cracked had been bought by a company that just clearly had no idea what it was or why sure, they wanted yeah. it yeah that this i'm imagining that that was the case yeah I don't know if it's annoying how often I bring up cracked. I know it's been years. <laughs> it's been like four years. I, it was, some people are like, Jesus, let it go. Um, so anyway, he gets into this nightmare scenario where they're like, no, we have to have it by test screenings for test screenings by X date. And then at some point he finds out they just went ahead and cut together a version of the movie and are holding test screenings without him. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile, they're looking at a movie called The Empty Man, and they're thinking about horror movies uh, with similar names, probably. And they're like, "Yeah, yeah, whatever, we get it." Yeah, sure. We, can we, well, get, we, can we, we, can we, we get this, this out is. in January? Scare some teens. Yeah, let's let's shit this thing out. <laughs> well, yeah. even worse, they're looking at it, thinking that's what it is. It's like, well, what's all this other stuff he shot? Like, why is there all right. this stuff with this? He shot all these scenes with these cults, and he does this big investigation to like this cult, and then. You actually hear from the cult leader and he explains his worldview and it's it makes sense. Like it makes sense as something that would draw people in. Like he really devoted effort to explaining what these people believe 
it's not just the Lovecraftian thing where it's right. like a bunch of crazies worshiping a monster. It's like it, it's it's more modern, like a self help type group would sound. And, and we the, should. Oh, sorry. We should note that it's Stephen Root as the yeah. cult leader. <laughs> Only yeah. scene and, he's in, but <laughs> yeah, and knocks it out of the park. Yeah, of because course. Yeah, almost Stephen. guaranteeing that the scene will stay in because they're like, well, it's Stephen Root. He's the most famous person yeah, in and this probably, movie. Yeah, paid him. Had to actually pay him, unlike the yeah. other unknowns in the movie. So anyway, after apparently they released this other cut of the movie to some of the worst test screening scores in cinema history. So they came back to him and said, look, you can finish your cut of the movie, because, but you have to do it in X number of days because the tax rebates from South Africa are set to expire, <laughs> um, which is Gosh. the only reason they shoot there. Like, I don't know if people realize this, this is why so many movies are shot in Georgia. It's because Georgia really got into offering these huge tax breaks to companies to do their production there. So there's this why The Walking Dead is in Georgia. And so... They basically went back again, rushed, locked the picture, scrambled to finish it. This was in 2018. And then he has this finished movie that he's been working on for two years. And it's the, the studios is like, okay, thank you. Bye. And then he has not been involved since then. So after this, Disney comes along and buys Fox. Now his movie is in the maw of Disney. He says, we can't find anybody that will even answer our calls now because they fired a bunch of people, moved a bunch of people around, like everything's been reshuffled. Like this, this movie is literally like, it's not even film reels. It's probably just like files on a hard drive somewhere, right? Like it's all, isn't yeah. it all digital? So to the company, it's just like, like Tom said, it's just a line on a, on a, an Excel sheet and an expense on an Excel sheet. And then to somebody else, somebody inherited like a PC with a bunch of huge video files on it. And that's your movie. This thing that you have traveled around the world, that you've had this idea for years, you have sweated and overcome weather delays and, and you've gone through the cast and you've been living this for two years. And now it's just in the belly of Disney. Like you don't even know who has it. And so he, they came back. And said at some point, like in 2019, okay, we're, we're gonna, we've got a release date for you. You know, we're like it's, the stuff is, is kind of settling in. It's going to be uh, April 2019. And he came back and said, no, it's going to be fall 2019. It's like, well, no, it'll be spring. It'll be spring 2020. It's like, well, no, that, that pandemic. It's and so eventually they just came back and it's like, okay, we're we'll putting it out in 2,000 theaters in September of 2020 when theaters are still kind of closed or the only people going to movies are like tenant couldn't make its money in the theaters <laughs> like and so they made this trailer which made it just look like the bye-bye man that he again didn't see until it was released he never saw the finished cut of the movie until he went to the theater and saw it and it was his cut but he never got like he says like i did a finished edit but without the soundtrack i did a finished soundtrack separately but i never got to see the finished product until i was watching it with other people because at that point he was at, out of the process like it that's what it's like Man, and so that's brutal yeah, yeah and so he then had to watch as this trailer came out saying hey this is a, a fun teen slasher movie because he says in movie marketing in this and everything i'm referencing he did an interview with the with thrillist if you if you just google thrillist david Pryor interview by or uh empty man interview He's extremely frank about all this. That's why it's it, that interview went viral. It's because he's very blunt. Because he has no reason to care now. Right. They've it, already it, shut him out. <laughs> yeah. Wait, what is? Yeah. What is? This? Disney doesn't even know his name. Right. And so he had to watch while they released Disney released this trailer that made his movie look like a slasher movie for teens. And what he says in that interview is that movie marketing is not about trying to connect your movie to a specific audience. Nope. It is about excluding certain audiences from your movie, making so they're not going to because that's how you get negative buzz if the wrong people are watching your movie if they're expecting right. romance and you they get action or vice versa. So they marketed this as slasher movie for teens for high school kids to go out and there'll be some boobs <laughs> and some some people get stabbed and it'll be yeah. eighty five minutes yeah. long. The uh, like, can you imagine being a teenager on like a date going to see this? Yeah, it, the this uh, two hour fifteen minute film. 
Well, yeah, not just just uh, a real bummer about interior yeah. madness. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> not just that, but he then had to watch mainstream audiences go to see it expecting that, and then this backlash of anger because again, when it came out in September, the reviews are from like these horror sites, and they're, they're like making fun of it. Because it's like, oh, it's it's like Bye Bye Man, except boring, except there's another hour of stuff on it. Because the, yeah. the marketing materials had prepped them to watch a certain movie. Whereas if it had been marketed like like Midsommar or about like Hereditary, like one of these more adult, mature, like slower paced, thoughtful horror movies, it would have been completely different because you go in expecting that. Yeah. Right. Those, uh, it's important to n- note um for people listening those those trailers are also like they're primarily for the theater owners like it's it's the the one of the big like i know um movie theater owners and 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 big chains and stuff get all the marketing materials beforehand and the trailers are for as much to convince theaters to book the movie as it is to convince people to go see it so it's like even more they're just trying to make it look like something that they can immediately recognize. Oh, this is like a horror movie. Okay. This will like, so immediately like an AMC manager will know like, okay, this is a bye bye man movie. It's going to make X amount of dollars on this weekend. I can give it, I can give it four weeks, you know, like it's, yeah, yeah, they're basically auditioning for the theater as much as they are for the audience. That's why you release it on September 30th. I mean, 2000 screens is pretty strong of an opening. Yeah, it's a lot. This is, it's Disney. So it's like, oh yeah, this will be a slasher thing for Halloween season. That will it will be a four quadrant type thing that for the whole family, <laughs> and yeah. uh, it, you know it's like any number of those those Bloomhouse slashers where they've somebody's made it and they just bought it for a song and and throw it out there right. and make make their money back thirty times over. And it's like, well, no, yeah, of course those initial audience scores were awful. Of course you had a bunch of bored 16-year-olds who were looking at their yeah. phones halfway through it. And that this as thing, a creator, that's like my nightmare scenario. Oh, yeah. This thing should have been like, this is like an, a film you'd see at the Arclight like, or like at the local, like, you know, whatever the indie theater place is where you expect, like you said, like a a more artsy slow burn type of horror yeah, or uh, but if, but there's some mainstream like you know like Get Out and Hereditary like those were marketed with trailers are extremely moody, extremely weird, and yeah. kind of off kilter. Like it, they, this is a common enough type of movie now that it's like yeah, this is for horror snobs, this is for people that are a little bit older. You know, right. it's gonna be it's gonna have some ambiguity. Like there, it, it's you they know how to market movies like this because there's been some monster hits like this. There's an audience for it, but it's mm-hmm. that's why it had to be frustrating because. Like his his attitude in this interview, which by the way is extremely compelling. I asked I yeah I asked people to go see it, especially if you're into like movie making and how movies get made, because it really gets into the the nitty gritty mm-hmm. of how the sausage is made. And that he's like he I watched Hereditary and I was extremely discouraged because like oh this is so similar to my movie and it has a lot of similar sequences or kind of the the similar things about you know some force taking people over and all that almost like well because this movie exists no one's going to want to see mine and that's not how it works no <laughs> like no you know I mean, now they're those the art house more hereditary films are like you said they're they're kind of being shat out now like yeah. they're 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 marketing them it's part of a machine now mm-hmm. uh, yeah they definitely recognize funny. and it's it's so interesting because like midsummer is a two and a half hour long slow burn horror movie and it did really well <laughs> yeah. because they marketed it to the right people the right audience right, because people oh, knew what they go, were go yeah. watch the trailer for the empty man and then go watch the trailer for midsummer yeah. yeah it is night and day like they they know how to signal what kind of movie it is but there's they asked him about and there's a quote here i'll read part of it they asked him about when he went and finally saw the movie with an audience and the quote is you know they asked him like well how did you feel once you finally saw because you did get to release your movie like they didn't release an 85 minute version it's, the, the cut off it's stuff honestly like, yeah from what you're how you're explaining how it went it's incredible to me that it turned out as well as it did yeah i think well i here's i think it's stuff like they cast steven root whether or not he knew he was doing it or not in a pivotal role that would be cut out if they tried to do the other version yeah so i think what happened was they probably looked at the footage and they're like we actually can't cut this down to like a 90 minute version 
it it would be there's not enough of like there there really isn't enough of the empty man the bye bye man version of the empty man you know like you would need a reshoots few, so i yeah, think that was the decision i think they yeah. were like okay we can either spike it and make nothing do reshoots for another 10 million dollars which makes it even more of a sunk cost or we can tell this guy which is what exactly what we told him you can finish it but you're not getting one more dollar of budget right like, like you then, yeah. you have to just take what you've got and and assemble it and he was happy to do that because it was his movie but they're like we're not giving you anything else so right. from their point of view it's like well it's either this or spend more to fix it. So why not just let the guy put it out there? <laughs> right. And they get, didn't care about it to such an extent that they were probably like, well, we have one person who seems to know what movie they're making. It's this guy. Let's have him do like do the thing. But we're you not going like, to let him talk like to marketing at all. We're not going to let yeah. him have any input into trailer. Like we're still going to try to sell it like a slasher which right. is that's anyway, but his, the quote was, he says, they asked him what it was, he felt when he saw it, finally saw it. He says, the studio's attitude toward the movie was so debilitating and so dismissive that I had almost been half convinced to not be proud of my movie. Wow. Then I saw it for the first time in the theater and I walked out of there with a new spring in my step. It's not perfect. There are things that I wish were better funded, which I, I think is interesting phrasing. There are things that I would have done differently, but there always will be, I assume. If you get to a point where you feel like, like it's perfect, you might as well quit. Um, there are certain things I can see where it's a little rough around the edges in certain spots and things could have been more concise here and there. But overall, he said he was very happy with it because he got to make his movie. And so many people don't get to, you know, get the movie gets taken away from them as, you know, the whole thing with the Snyder cut. Right. You know, you have people asking for the prior cut of this movie instead of some 85 minutes. So, like, that at least happened. And the fact yeah. that it's getting rediscovered now and why this is, like, my mission to tell people about it mm-hmm. is because of all that. Because that's that's rough. And that's kind of symbolizes everything that's wrong with having one studio control half of the movies that are getting made, if not more, yeah, right? It's it's one of the problems, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, from um, the creative end, like there's yeah, a lot of yeah, problems sure, yeah. but from, it, from the point of a director. And it's like, wow, I get to make a movie for Disney. It's like, man, you are you're on an assembly line. Like you'll never talk to someone who actually cares about you. It That's the thing is it is this movie does have issues. It's not perfect. No, but it, oh, it really doesn't matter because you watch it and it's such a it really is a big swing and it mostly nails it. And the history that you're talking about, it's like, yeah, I am. I can't believe I'm it turned out as well as it did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, I, quick, did you guys recognize who's the main character? Yeah, it's James Badge Dill. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, what he have was I in seen another, him in? He was Lone the, Ranger, one of the, uh, Iron Man 3. He's the uh, guy in the Iron Patriot suit in Iron Man 3. Yeah, he's the bad guy in Iron Man 3. He's in a movie called The Standoff at Sparrow Creek, which I just... Whenever I can, I tell people to watch that. That's oh, that's a really been on my movie. list forever. Yeah, yeah, he's the main that. character in that too. He's like a. It's interesting because he's he doesn't have many like big starring roles, but no, he's mostly this, character stuff. Yeah, this in the Empty Man or this uh, this in Sparrow Creek. It's like, damn, he he's has good taste, or he's getting picked for the right things, because those are both two like indie films that I think are really good that not too many people seem to know about. I don't know. So uh, he had an extremely difficult challenge in this movie because of once you find out what the twist is, th- there were certain things about his performance where he had to convey that he's like losing his mind or that he's unmoored or that he doesn't really know why he's doing what he's doing that can come off as just him being wooden or, or, or whatever. Right. Um, but yeah. It's I don't know. It's a difficult ask what he, they were asking him to to do yeah, here. I was thinking about that coupled with the fa- like he's still good in the scenes that he gets to do in this movie. Um, I was thinking about that coupled with the fact that for gosh, like 80, 90 minutes of this movie, it's a detective story. So it's really he doesn't speak much. It's just him going from place to place with a flashlight and discovering new elements of the plot, which he's, he's like gritty detective guy, which uh, is kind of the role he always plays. Uh, same with Sparrow Creek. And it's not that you 
can't do those roles well. It's just there. There's not that much on the page, so it was probably uh, each, uh, additionally challenging on top of having yeah. to convey really subtle things about you know losing his mind in this downward downward spiral spiral i do i like how he because there's i love the dynamic of tough guy dealing with ghost shit that scene uh, where they all stop and he's like uh, yeah no <laughs> he just yeah. runs away <laughs> yeah that cult scene is it's really like, really well done it was yeah because it was creepy but then it also had that that jack burton moment from big trouble oh yeah, show, show, like, oh yeah. fuck this <laughs> like, like, oh tell what the hell is that don't tell me <laughs> yeah there was a that that was a fantastic scene um it's real good yeah there, that i scene. don't want to I don't spoil want to spoil it, too it yeah. much, but it's someone watching a group from afar and you even though there's this like safety and distance you just you don't feel safe it's still so it. creepy yeah yeah and it ties into what the thing that, it, you know, again, as we've alluded to, once you go down an hour into the movie, you go down the rabbit hole of what's actually going on. You find he finds this cult and nothing is scarier to me than a cult it, for whatever reason. I, I, I have cults turn up in half the books I've written or things that, that function like cults where there's people that have been brainwashed in some way. It is, you know, in the real world, something like QAnon where you have something that's almost like a mind virus where you just start losing family members to it and right. they start like posting QAnon memes and it's like, Oh, they've, they've, they've got you. Yeah. been sucked into the QAnon. Yeah. on it. Somehow they've put together this idea that is so compelling to a certain type of person that they will abandon their families for it, even though it's ludicrous. Yeah. And cults have a way of doing that. They always have, they always will. Where if you're in a certain mindset in a certain place in your life, if you're a certain type of person, it, they've just got this set of ideas and slogans and practices that just unlock your brain like a mm -hmm. key and turn you into a weird robot. If you watch any documentary about people like encountering Scientologists or going up against Scientologists and when they meet a group of Scientologists, it is chilling because yeah, they have go, this. Uh, yeah glazed eyed expression in their face they, they they have these techniques and these slogans and these methods of talking that they've practiced over and over again and it is so weird that's why as a little kid um i stopped saying the pledge of allegiance and i wouldn't when i would go to church with my dad i wouldn't say the lord's prayer anymore <laughs> because something about everyone repeating that chant in unison really fucked with me yeah. Oh yeah, like, I was like, and I is, don't like this. It is like mind, as a little kid, I was like nine, ten. Yeah, it is brain science. If you get a group of people to chant or sing in unison, the critical thinking part of your brain shuts down because the group ritual part of your brain is just a different part of your brain. You know, humans are are tribal. So mm -hmm. if you go to a seminar, you go to a self help thing, and they make you chant a slogan over and over again, repeat it, or if they have you sing a song or, or anything like that. Um, and you know, or it's like, whereas like a call and response where the guy at the stage is making all the crowd do something in, in response to, they are trying to override your critical thinking. If you look at boot camps in the military and they've got like the little slogans they shout while they're marching. If you yep. give someone, make someone repeat a phrase over and over again. If you make them very tired, if you make them very hungry, they are putty in your hands. Uh, and it's every cult, even cults that have been started independently and never met each other, they all arrive at the same playbook because it is it is a, a proven one. Yeah. It's also, there's an element. And this movie touches on it without ever really hitting it directly on the head. But cults uh, specifically seek out people who are uh, vulnerable. So you'll find a lot of like recovering addicts or people who just went through a major loss. And that's in this movie, like the uh the girl lost her father um and that's how she got swept up into this group but they never they don't like belabor it but it is there and like she i mean we're already spoiling it but like the idea is that the detective character is just a con like they created him he's a golem basically they they yeah. used a, a, a group think to conjure him uh, they use the term tulpa Yep. Uh, yep. I believe, they sure do. Which, which <laughs> X Files is that? Arcadia, where the villain's a Tulpa. Yep. 
It's a uh, Twin but Peaks. It's like a trash it, it turns up in yeah. Twin Peaks too. It's basically you've used thought to manifest a person. It's it's a few yeah. movies and properties. So I think there's yeah. a Tulpa in the X Files at one point. I'm sure. Yeah, sure yeah, there yeah. Was. It's so Arcadia. It's a tr- it's a great. A that's great the one. Mulder that's... and Scully have to go undercover. Oh, you as a were married couple saying the name of an X Files episode. There. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. I thought <laughs> you guys are so deep into X Files. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. chronicling too that deep, I too deep. Uh, yeah, you're citing deep. specific episode names to so uh yeah, and but yeah anyway is, my point was she she put that grief onto him she gave him the grief of losing a wife and child and the guilt of having an affair on top of it but none of that happened she put that onto him so here's where it, i am hesitant to say anything negative about this because I, again i want people to go watch it the, if i have a complaint about the movie and i think reading the interview with david Pryor, i think he kind of shares this idea that the closest in most movies that are pointed at teens where they find the artifact that grants you five wishes and they're all murderous or where you accidentally summon the bloody Mary from your mirror or whatever. Right. There's always a scene where they run into the person who knows what's going on. The expert expert says, well, you know, I found this old book and this guy was murdered by the townspeople in 1923 and uh because he was falsely accused of blah 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 sometimes they'll literally like skype in a famous actor <laughs> what movie was that with vincent d'onofrio skypes into the movie that's to uh, explain everything it's he, it's um uh sinister Sinister. There was a there was a time because he was also in I think Rings. He was in Rings. Where like yeah. Vincent D'Onofrio kept showing up to explain. He was a, he was actually in Rings though because you remember he turns out to be the bad guy. Oh okay yeah. Like he's yeah. actually in it, but yeah. <laughs> they they literally just Skype him in a uh, uh, Sinister. Uh, Sinister. He's just yeah. on a computer screen. Yeah. And people who don't have never read any of my books, my horror series, the John Dies at the End books, it, the, the recurring. There's a recurring joke beat where every time they encounter someone who knows what's going on, they're either lying or they're crazy or else the main characters are just not paying attention. It, like, <laughs> the, like it keeps setting up. We're going to run into someone who understands what's happening and it just keeps not not working. It's the, that person dies partway through or whatever, because anyone writing horror, that scene is in there somewhere. You know, you go to the, yeah. the hero goes to the library and finds the microfilm if that still exists mm-hmm. right so nowadays they just google it uh, yeah and whatever yeah. we could but they can't call it google in most movies so it's like right searchmonster.com yeah. it's like wait <laughs> a if second it, if it's if it's a sony movie they're using bing for some unholy right. reason yeah, it's wait a second uh, th- 13 <laughs> children were killed in this house back when it was an asylum <laughs> in 1904 um the closest this gets to that is there's a scene at the end where the guy finally comes face to face with the girl he's the the missing girl he's been tracking through the whole movie mm-hmm. and she basically tells him what's happening and says, you're a Tulpa, we did this, we did this, and, and and she kind of has to, it's the closest this movie comes to that, because up to that point, this movie has been brilliant about you grabbing pieces of information that are intriguing, but kind of just raise more questions, and it, it keeps right. implying that it's bigger and worse, the situation is bigger and worse than what you thought, like it does yeah. a great job of parceling out information, and then finally at the end, I think he as a screenwriter knew, or maybe someone told him, or maybe on a revision, but at some point somebody's like, no, he has to meet this. It, like, like, you could do a version of this ending where there's no dialogue, where you just see stuff happen, and you see what, like him realizing that, like calling that woman, and she doesn't know who he is, the, the yep, woman right. who you thought had been his friend the whole movie, and without really... And then let the the viewer kind of put together, oh, he didn't exist prior to the events of this movie. And this movie doesn't do that. He he has a conversation where she gives him the first full expedition, exposition dump of here's what has mm-hmm. been happening up till now. Yeah. And that's the only time I feel like the movie doesn't it's... work because I feel like what she's explaining... The way she explains it kind of undoes what was supposed to be like the emotional core of the movie. And I get why that would turn people off. And I don't yeah. know that you needed I that. There's this, uh, in terms of screenwriting, I think there's a, a hump that you have to get over 
where like I've written enough stuff where like you get feedback that's like you need to explain this better uh and you don't want to right like sometimes it's like no i want i want people to either yep. figure it out or not yep. but if you're trying to get something made it needs to be something that you can slap down in front of anybody and they'll get it so there's always the over explaining there's a push pull yeah i've gotten that i've got yeah that. i've gotten that feedback before on i th- on stuff. yeah and so i do think this would have been more effective because they you know what it reminded me of a little bit, and I, I wonder if this also gave people like bad associations, is The Wicker Man. Because it's kind of similar where they're like, no, it's all about you. Yeah, it's always been it you. Was, you were the game the always, whole time, yeah. Exactly. This missing person it, it wasn't missing. We were doing that. So, yeah, I think uh, if it, they, they really have to spell it out. Um, but I did like some of that where they're like, you were born in a restaurant with the like wait staff singing happy birthday because it's the first scene of him sort and the of the idea we, that we, like the first time we see him he's actually in his shop and he sells the lady oh the, you're right the, the yeah. pepper spray yeah. and he has a a little like a gift certificate or whatever a gift card for the restaurant that's like free birthday right. free birthday meal and that's the first time you uh, yeah and in the, the twist again we're fully spoiling it. You can stop the recording now. I, it, my my favorite to every podcast is host. I keep telling people to stop listening oh, to yeah. the podcast. Mm-hmm. But but in seri- <laughs> seriously though, <laughs> you can watch the end. You can watch the movie and then come back and listen to the rest of it because we're getting into the the actual ending and the actual. Some people think that knowing the twist ruins the movie, but no good movie relies on. Right, the it's twist the yeah. execution. There's that, also I know yeah. a lot of people who just like prefer. Like, I know people who literally read the Wikipedia of a movie before they watch it. Mm -hmm. Like, there's some people who just don't like being surprised. Well, especially Uh, with horror movies. Some people don't want... Especially with horror, yeah. They don't want to be traumatized by it's something that, you know... Right. If people have past trauma, like, sometimes you don't want to be surprised. Yeah, you don't want to get surprised by some shit. Yeah. Yeah. I've had a couple of disastrous... (laughs) Oh, yeah. ...movie viewings because of that. Yeah, Yeah. especially in my case, this is dumb, but if, like, the dog dies in the movie that's something i want to know before i make the decision to watch it right uh that's my thing I... well the dog dies in this movie <laughs> i thought uh, it was a cat no that was a i think there were multiple uh, animals that die in this movie Tom. yeah 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 there well, are to be clear to dog. be clear they're already dead yeah, yeah they, we don't nothing we don't see an animal die in this but we you find just see corpses. corpses of animals you don't come to love an animal and then see it like horribly killed which is the thing yeah. that yeah. i can't like the dog and i am legend yeah which yeah, right. which is yeah i stopped watching that movie at that point yeah um, that's okay you stopped watching it at the correct point <laughs> <laughs> the movie gets way 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 worse after that but, the first hour of that movie is very good and then it goes straight off a cliff if I think when he talks about like rough edges or about things that could have been executed better, whatever, I, sus- I would suspect he would probably cut that ending differently if he could. But I only say that because it is extremely difficult to do a twist that works on every level. It is extremely difficult. <laughs> Mm-hmm. The, yeah. there's been we have seen so many movies with bad twists where the twist is just it feels obligatory like in the wonder woman movie which i mostly the first one which i mostly liked but the twist is like the guy that was nice to her all along is actually <laughs> the villain David and it's Seamus. like it added nothing <laughs> it's it, there's no reason for it it makes no sense or, you know, and you can tell that a twist was added in, like, the fifth draft where there's literally nothing foreshadowing right. it. Right, like, why would, right. why would the Greek god of war be living as a British politician? Right, and still <laughs> look like the British politician in the flashbacks to his yeah, Greek yeah, god of war days. Yeah, he's all jacked. <laughs> yeah, he still have, like, the same facial hair. If I, am I remembering that right, or I dream that? Yeah, no, you remember correct. Have you watched yeah. the, Have you watched Zack Snyder's Justice League yet? Oh, yes, I have. Because he comes back. <laughs> Oh my no god! No spoilers, guys. I haven't watched it. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't want. I don't want it spoiled. <laughs> that that recut of a movie from like I, uh, several years I ago. I wrote. I wrote over uh, an entire article just about his brief scene in that movie, and it really made a lot of fan, uh, Zack Snyder fans angry <laughs> <laughs> because it was very funny to me. Anyway, so everyone listening to this can think of a movie whose twist they've hated. Because the next time you watch the movie, you realize, well, that didn't make sense. It, it, it's, 
you know oh yeah well and it's or the thing where in james bond it's it's uh they introduced i can't remember the actor's name but he turns out it's like i secretly did all of the oh, stuff in the previous Spectre, yeah uh, christoph Spectre. waltz christoph waltz yeah i secretly have done all of the things in the previous movies that that clearly yeah, kind of clearly, like ruins the other movie because like those movies especially, were made yeah clearly we're not that was not intended no and but like, like especially movies. like like a movie like skyfall where it was like the villain had a very personal vendetta and it's like nope i yeah. engineered it all it's like okay what are you it talking all, about the, the where behind it all always falls apart even in good movies like spoiler but like the game which i guess is a movie from 97 that doesn't make any sense no. that twist oh yeah but it doesn't it's, matter doesn't it's, matter it's I funny enjoy that movie you can it, it's funny because uh, it's a Fincher film. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about this guy who's BFFs with Fincher. Uh, right. You can read interviews with David Fincher where he's like, "Oh yeah, that movie doesn't work after <laughs> after the yeah. first time you watch." <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of that where yeah, the, the the twist is it's it's the it's the thing where you need a twist where it's like it does feel clever at the moment, uh, and hopefully you don't think about it too much. There's the mm-hmm. movie Perfect Stranger that goes the other way where Holly Berry ends up being the killer even though she has scenes where she's by herself and she's afraid of the killer. Right, it's like, it's high tension. It's, like, it's it's impossible. Yeah, exactly, where it's like, "Oh, you can't you're cheating. Mm-hmm. You're just cheating yeah. at or that point." Or my cheating. favorite where it's like this whole movie was a hallucination on your part including scenes you weren't in. Yeah. Right. yeah. Things yep. you weren't there to see were part of a hallucination you were having. So this conversation that these cops were having miles away that you didn't hear, yeah, that was also part of your yeah, mad, your madness. That, you imagined uh, a scene you weren't there for. That's how crazy you are. It was all part of your programming you, for this You secret. manifested <laughs> yeah, people. Remember yeah. um, uh, Capone did that. Remember that, Dave? <laughs> oh, like, yeah, barely that, remembering Capone. With, like, Matt, Dill- Matt Dillon turns out to be an imaginary friend, but we get a scene with Matt Dillon by himself with his girlfriend. <laughs> yes! <laughs> and it's like, wait. It's like, what the... F- did did Al Capone imagine this, too? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gave so, the whole uh, backstory? <laughs> uh, again, that's a case where was it added in reshoots, the twist? Was it added in a late dra- draft of the script? Was it... What? And the answer is, or did they just truly assume you just only watch the movie once? Who cares? Right. <laughs> so doing a twist that works. Like, I feel like the sixth sense, no matter what has happened in my Shyamalan in the year sense, I feel like that twist, which changed cinema, that became the day when every movie had to have a twist. Even even a, a Disney cartoon has to have a twist at the end where the villain yeah. turns out to be good or something. It works beautifully because... One, it makes sense, basically based on the, the rules they yeah. established. That the, that the ghosts are not fully sane. That they're not able. To, and and you know, once you die and you're a ghost, you're you've kind of you're deranged. Like you're convincing yourself well, you're still alive. Right. Specifically, it's denial. Like yeah, it's denial yeah. to the point. And then, but two, <clears> it <throat> does not undermine the emotional core of the movie because throughout the movie, Bruce Willis has been this guy who's in this midlife crisis. He had this tragedy with a patient. He has never forgiven himself. He's estranged from his wife. He's just kind of wandering around, and then he runs into this kid who can talk to dead people, and it's this interesting case. And then when you find out he's dead, it brings his character arc to closure because mm-hmm. it's like he was adrift. He was wandering around as a, a spirit. He had died. It makes perfect sense. It's, he was not suffering from a midlife crisis. He was suffering from having lost his actual life and could mm-hmm. not come to terms with it. He couldn't. Yeah, he couldn't make the things right with and his, yeah. his, his um, wife, yeah. talent. Brought him the reality of that and brought him to a close and brought this kid's arc to a close too because he talked yep. to someone who could who could talk back and help him work through what this these abilities mean and he helped him they helped each other it all wraps itself nicely and if you watch the movie a second time it works a it second still holds time. up yeah this, because the story yeah. is still Haley there Haley Joel yeah. Osment's guys- character and Bruce Willis's character and the way they play off each other and seeing it recontextualized it it makes sense yeah it doesn't it doesn't diminish it at all right uh do you you guys know the the yep. the wildest fact about that script yeah. right yeah it's like that the was, sixth draft before yeah. he added that part <laughs> yeah yep. it's freaking, which is so, so crazy because it's, so, it's so it's so perfect it's like it had of course this is 
I feel like we've is. all hit those, right? Where we're like, oh, I've been building up to this thing the whole yep. time and oh, didn't yeah. even realize you, Sometimes it. you just can't see it when you're in there. Yeah. Like when you're in the weeds, you just can't see it. Well, it's just like, yeah. have both of you seen this full series of Breaking Bad? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, it's like it's like Jesse the, as a character is supposed to show up for like one episode to get Walt into meth and just to disappear. He's supposed to get killed or something. Yeah, he right. was gonna he was it, gonna get killed off in the first season. It was not far into the series when they realized, oh, this is what the show is about: is this surrogate father and son relationship between Walter and this and Jesse? Like, this is what yeah. the show's about. We we did not know this is not the show we pitched. This is not what we set out to make. But seeing the two on screen with each other. And seeing this concept of like these two people on different moral arcs, like one guy is being corrupted and one guy is corrupted think, and, and is yeah. trying to, and like seeing how this these two intersect with each other and eventually, you know, and it's like, oh, this is the heart of the show, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I feel like it makes a show like Breaking Bad go down a little bit easier because like I really liked The Shield as well, but The Shield is tough to rewatch because it's just about downfall. Yeah. Whereas Breaking Bad, it's about Walter White's downfall, but also it's about Jesse's redemption. So you yeah. still have that. It's like, oh, there's so- something here. So this is not like a total bummer. <laughs> and that sometimes yeah. in father-son relationships, it's the mistakes of the father that you learn from. Mm-hmm. That you can be, you can see the horrible things the father figure does and decide, I'm not going to be that. That it's not it's not car- carrying on a torch. It's choosing to drop it. And so then that on the only end of the series when Jesse like walks away from Walter and it's like no I'm not you know do it yourself and then he dr- he drives away and he's free not just of that compound but he's free of Walter White and it all works beautifully and it was all an accident it was all because they <laughs> they happened to cast a brilliant actor as Jesse and the two of them together it's just amazing and it all happens it all happens on on the fly and so yeah anyone out there creating things. If you ever get upset that your your thing doesn't work or you have to change it or you have to rework it, man, you may be about to stumble into the thing you didn't know you were you were making. Yeah. Um do we have any more like any more final thoughts about this movie? Well, man, <laughs> final thoughts. I I feel like we barely touched on the movie, but you're it's, it's probably for the best because yeah people can still sort yeah, of yeah. watch it i was i mean we're talking about other movies now <laughs> so I was like, oh yeah <laughs> no trying to bring I, the conversation just, back to i was just gonna say that it's this is a movie where once you if you watch it a second time i don't know 100 percent that it it makes sense or that you'll you'll necessarily get the enjoyment out of there it is because like like it I, turns out most of his investigation didn't happen because you see him talking right. to cops and the cops know him and he was an ex cop, but it's like, Oh, so he didn't exist. So that conversation wasn't real. Were those cops real? And that I can get why people would say, well, all of the stuff, the emotional char- core of the character, which is that he's in a state of grief over the loss of his wife and his child. And he's, he's like trying to seek out this lost kid as redemption. Like I can save this kid where I couldn't save my own, blah, blah, blah. And then right. for that, at the end, it's like, oh, no, it's you hallucinated your wife, child, the affair, everything you've done. It's all it. We all just programmed it. Right. But I also would say the the writer said in that interview that no one when he sees like like critics talking about the movie, no one really gets the ending. And I would think he's implying that. The stuff about him being a tulpa and have him him having just been born that that may have been a lie that that's just part of the cult's is. programming. Yeah, I think it is. And that the way cults work is they detach you from everything in your life. They make it look like everything mm-hmm. in your life up till now was just misery, and now you're finally among. You finally found your purpose. And so the line she tells him that comes across in the movie like the villain explaining his plan on a on a whiteboard <laughs> and yeah. what was the leo to cap shutter island he literally has like a yeah like a whiteboard oh, yeah. and it's and it's we've the, 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 i still like shutter island because it's well made because it's scorsese but like man the <laughs> the audience is already there and it takes leo two hours to get there yeah, oh, like, yeah. And also you're the makes, prisoner you're the missing makes, prisoner there's, there's definitely <laughs> no like, sense whatsoever absolutely yeah. does not <laughs> It does not hold up that they would do what they that they would stage this elaborate 
prank basically on this but, as uh, part of his therapy or whatever it really yeah. is like a, an art of figuring out how to do a twist because i've been thinking about uh the movie the witch and it's not really a twist but it's implied that like everything that happens is a recruitment technique in that movie or yes. like it's a it's a it's a coven attracting her to it but yes. they again there's no point where they're like so here's what we did uh they don't explain it no, you, because the movie cl- works clear. whether or not yeah. you understand exactly that. and that's why i think, I think yeah. this movie didn't need that scene you just right. need to show him coming unmoored from his previous life and he right. is now an empty man he's part of their cult yeah, which, it's which just lies were true him down yeah or yeah. which hallucinations were true or is the stuff he's seen is it really happening or not didn't you know, when he shot, shoots the guy in the head that it doesn't matter the story is that this guy has become unmoored because that's what cults do to people and yeah yeah they, he doesn't know what's truth or what's a lie yeah they specifically gaslight and there's a lot of yeah. there's a lot of moments where you could like when he's in the police station for instance when he goes there he brings them the files and the one detective wants him to write a statement and there's a bunch of cops that are kind of like side-eyeing him um right. and then like a couple of scenes he has with the mom where she like when he drops her off at the hotel she lingers for a bit like she wants to say something to him but then she leaves um right and then when he finds his own file and it's full of like his personal shit and like photographs of his family he's like how did how do you how do you have this but we see later that his house is empty they could have cleaned out his house they know where he lives right um so, so it's like, like there it's yeah they the seeds are there where it could be that he they are just convincing him that he is a construct right it staying ambiguous is great because yeah when when they create hard rules then yeah it's the question of like wait why do the cops know about his past if he's a tulpa so on and so forth mm-hmm. it's just yeah it really it it could have been a lot looser at the end which is funny because that's just less like the director just had to include less yeah as opposed to shoot anything else that doesn't cost anything you know yeah you just um, take some stuff out it's an editing choice and maybe they were scared like no we can't we really uh, after all this marketing and everything like if we really confuse people at the end it's gonna piss people off more i don't know but had this been presented like a movie like the witch and everybody knew what they were going into it would have been really good if yeah they had told you very little uh at the end about what was happening Mm -hmm. or what the truth was yeah as long as we got the idea of like he's been driven into this cult it does enough throughout the movie too where it just it 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 makes like visual connections so you know like uh like when we see the the robed figure in in the prologue does the same like mirroring footsteps and rapid footsteps that the cult later does so we're like oh okay we can connect that like the movie does enough so that you make connections but it doesn't explain why those things are connected right you just know that they are and that that's bad yeah it's not good definitely not good not ideal i can (laughs) say that the times i've written twists into stories which is most times i personally had to start with the twist and build out it's the the book that i always that's coming on here to promote the called Zoe punches the future and the dick. It has spoiler a twist that the story started with that twist and worked backward mm-hmm. because yep. I, I couldn't make it work. Otherwise I'm not a good enough writer to just come up on the fly and then work backward. It's like, no, it has to like, it has to fit one with the theme of the story. It's got to fit with the, the theme of the character. It can't undo any of the emotional arc where it's like, Oh, you thought you were, you were doing this, but it was all you dreamed it. You dreamed it all. It's not that it's more about bringing it around to this person's their what they already fear, you know, yeah. and their own personal blind spots. And that you think you're yeah. chasing a person, but you're actually chasing a system. And yeah, I think because otherwise, what's the point of the journey? Right. I think the idea of a good twist, right, is that it always existed, right? It needs yeah, to be part of well, the it's, foundation. It's it a needs mystery. To be, it's a mystery. It needs, you work backward exactly. from the solution. Yeah. And right. then you like I think the it's the same works with horror in general is I like 
the idea of having very specific rules in your mind and then you only show people pieces of that so it feels yes. disjointed but it's consistent this uh, brings up a question um that i realized i wanted to ask jason uh jason do you care if i spoil john dies at the end of the first book um no i don't know i don't care uh how did you feel the movie takes out the idea that that david wong is a is a is a is a clone right um did that was that like super important to the story it did that how did you feel when that wasn't included in the adaptation i'm just curious it's super important to the book a lot of the stuff that that ties into is also not in the movie if you were making a second movie that's that would be in there but i get why if you if you have like it's a tight again 90 minute movie 100 minute movie whatever Mm-hmm. It, from a book that's 155,000 words long. That's a it's long a, dense, it's a book. It, it, it could book. Be, a lot happens in it. <laughs> it could be a season of, of a TV show, and maybe one day will be. I don't, who knows? Um, mm. that, so to add that on at the end, when you've had to take out a lot of the, the connective tissue, like a lot of the sequence that led up to it, it would mm-hmm. feel like just... I think it would just come across as one more crazy twist, like on top of yeah. everything else. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, you know, like finding out that, that the, the narrator who's interviewing him is not alive and, and just all that. It would just feel like uh, it right, was gratuitous. Right, to add that on top of that. I think, yeah. So yeah, could, I think there's a... The, the, oh, go on. Well, it, it's like the intro is still like the ship of the sea thing. You know, it's, it's the axe that... And you say, well, that was supposed to be symbolism true, yeah, for I what... <laughs> Just yeah. watched WandaVision. That didn't even occur to me that you started your story with the same riddle. Yeah, but and so in the book, it's supposed to be it starts with that, and then, then you find out that the narrator this entire time has been someone else, but he seems to be the same. So he's like, "Well, is it still me?" Um, and so you, I, I think people would complain that it starts off with that riddle, and then it doesn't it doesn't have that payoff. But one, if there was another movie, there would be, and we the feeling was always that there would be more stuff it, it, if people wanted to see it god willing it's just as we have explained sometimes that can be difficult to pull off in hollywood yeah that too i think without that it's just a brief insight into how the narrator thinks it, yeah, it's a can... very quick look into the world he's living in and that he's kind of overthinking it but not in a way that's useful at all. <laughs> like, yeah, I was going to say it still works just at face value because it kind of introduces the idea that there is this crazy uh, other world of the supernatural and like his attitude towards it. And yeah, yeah, the the idea that's like, if I, it's not worth it. It's not worth the effort to think about why any of this is happening. It's just happening. So we'll just right. deal with it. And that, that what we now think of as like the the millennial way of thinking where it, it's somebody who doesn't have a career and doesn't have like a purpose in life. And so he's just obsessed with like trivia and thought exercises and just and so he like has these observations about what's going on and what's going on is madness but all all he can do is kind of like think things about it, but he's not effective at fighting it or anything. It's <laughs> so it's you know it's supposed to be like this archetype of the character in the twenty something character is just kind of adrift, but it's smart, but it's just not trained to do anything. So that opening riddle is it's just like this is what's running through his mind. This is remembering this insanity that happened to him, and that, uh, so I think it works on its own like that. But that's the kind of thing. You convert a, a book into a movie. There's a years long process of this right. tortured, emotionally gut wrenching experience of like what you wanted. Like this guy says, it, 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 I, I read that quote earlier from David Pryor. It's like there are some scenes I wish were better funded. That's yeah, I get so the, perfect. I get the sense. Also, though, yeah, when you're that, adapting a novel, I think it's I I there has been authors who've done the like the screenplay of their novels that just sounds exhausting though because it is it's it's like how the best stephen king adaptations are usually the ones where they're like we're throwing out most of the things well it's stanley kubrick just saying look i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna tell the story the way i know how to tell it like we're from i'm from a different part of the world i have a totally different worldview 
but it's going to be all style. It's all going to be like the menace is going to come it's, from the filmmaking. And Stephen King, like, well, it's like, no, the menace comes from the words, the beautiful words right. I wrote. And like, there are ways to stay um, true to the original like content, but like most of the time, it's like I, it's so dense. Yeah, uh, the novel that it's like I have to take things out, and I'm going to sit here and hope that the things I take out aren't going to uh, piss off too many people. You well, know, there's there's two sides to that. The one side is like it's a big job to tackle, but like for example, Michael Crichton got paid five hundred thousand dollars to write the screenplay for Jurassic Park. Oh, yeah. So it's yeah. like, yeah, if you're going to pay me half a million dollars to try to turn this into a movie, yeah, I'll give it a shot. And then, of course, they why... just they bring David Kep in to make it a movie. Right. <laughs> um, but then you also have that's... like, oh, what's that? Oh, no, go on. I was just going to say, uh, I remember John Grisham uh, in the 90s famously uh, had an interview when his book started to blow up and get made into movies. And they're like, how do you feel about the adaptations? It's like, look, once they... They can do whatever they want. <laughs> like I wrote the book, my thing exists. They can do whatever yeah. they want with it. Stan, Stan Lee was the same, where he's just like, I just like seeing versions of stuff I made. Yeah, that's probably like, really cool to see what yeah. other people do with your idea. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Also, I, don't know, I think the miniseries now, the rise of that is like I've said it before. I want to see a miniseries of Jurassic Park. I oh, want to see them yeah. go back to the novels and mm-hmm. be like, forget. Like it's such a, it would be such a bold thing to say, but be like. Yeah, all right. We have the Spielberg version. Let's do like a nuanced mini series version. That's just like more faithful uh, to the book because that book is yeah. is surprisingly dense. Oh yeah, and so like fuck it, why not? Yeah, you know? give it a shot. Th- that's we could do a whole episode on like the art of adapting things because like oh, yeah. here, yeah, this, no, let's, <laughs> let's let's not forget this guy started by adapting a graphic novel and immediately scrapped every word of it other than the, the broad concept and the universe right. that it takes place in. That's so, interesting. There's a, uh, boom studios did a couple of, uh, specifically Lovecraft graphic novels. They did a call of Cthulhu run, um, that were pretty good. Uh, so it's interesting that this seems to be their, their, Oh, is that the of, same people who did? The yeah. That's the same people. Did, yeah, did the the Empty Man. Man. Yep. yeah. And it's, this was like an eight issue run that you can now be bought as one edition, which I guess is how they always do it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and it's, and it's out there and I, it's probably good. I think it has 12 reviews on Amazon. So not many Jeez. people have, have read this. Wow. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's because if you're a writer, it, novels and screenplays, one are very different. You guys have both written screenplays, haven't you? Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's a very different thing. It, it yes, is it not. Is. It is not <laughs> just yeah, extremely. If you're writing a script for something that's actually going to get made versus just something you're writing on spec, like you want to get it out there. Writing a novel, whatever I want to happen, happens. If this yep. fight takes place on the lip of a volcano on Mars, boom, that's where it is. If you're writing a movie... And you know, like, let's say you've got a budget of, I don't know, this movie had a budget of $4 million. So you got $4 million to spend. You have to write it knowing what you've got to spend Mm -hmm. and knowing what you can make look good. You have to know something about filmmaking to write a script that, that works. You know, again, once you know... Again, if it's actually going to get made, where you actually know what your budget's going to be, you know what your limitations are going to be, you got to think in those terms. So that if you've got a key sequence that's like a pivotal sequence that requires them to shoot it in Japan. Right. The reality is they're going to come back and say, okay, well, what if this takes place in their kitchen? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's the first thing you write in a scene is interior, exterior. Those three letters determine a lot because when you're shooting exterior, it's so much harder because there's so much right to as soon control. as right as like, soon as a producer reads ext they're like Ugh. yeah it's like <laughs> oh all right so yeah there is that element of like yeah especially if you're starting out if you're doing like indie it's like yeah you need you need to it's it's why there's so there's so much found footage or why there's so many horror movies 
have you noticed there's a bunch of horror movies that take place in the woods lately <laughs> and there are a lot of indie movies and i think it's just they're like ah we can shoot in the woods pretty easily and we don't have Not to manage that easily, we don't have to get a like, permit we don't have to manage crowds yeah like it's still a nightmare to shoot in the woods but it's just there's yeah there's certain there's a couple of logistical elements that are removed yeah but yeah in terms of money it's just cheaper yeah uh, yeah so like yeah so if you oh, sorry. if you asked me to write a, a movie version of John Dies Dan, for instance, you would get one of two things. You would either get a four hour long epic that would cost three hundred million dollars to shoot, <laughs> or if I were being honest with myself, you would get a completely new story, pared down, pared way down, something that limits the number of people involved, something that limits the you know, all takes place in that town. Because I would try very hard to go the other direction. It's like, I want to make sure that what I write stays in. So I would, yeah. you know, like one of the first things, the, the main monsters in the movie, the, in the books, the shadow people do not turn up in the movie. That is, there's no way to make them look menacing in a movie without a whole bunch of CGI done on a very large scale. And, and if you don't do it, well, then they just look comical. And and these are the creatures that are not supposed to be comical, right? So I would I would have written something that was even different, even more different than the movie turned out to be, because I would be thinking, okay, in order to preserve what I'm writing here, it's all gotta be scaled down. Like this scene that takes place in a moving car is gonna now gonna take place in a room. And this because I have some awareness just by being around people of what goes into, you know, I've written videos. Like I, I have some sense of like Tom said that you, the moment you do an exterior location, it now costs five times more to shoot it. And so I would actually probably go back to scratch with the characters and have key beats that I wanted, but otherwise write it new, brand new. And just because, because it's mine, I wouldn't feel bad about doing that. But it would not be right. something like the the Fifty Shades of Grey lady who was like demanding all of these specific things be in the movie that, <laughs> <laughs> and these really bad lines and stuff that, that they kept trying to talk her out of. It's like, no, this this must it must be scene for scene, including I stuff that when I was writing this as fanfic. These story right, it threads was Twilight that I, fan fiction. Yeah, these story threads that I wrote and then forgot about. That's got to go in the movie, too. It's all it's sacred lore now. The fans demand it where I, I introduced this, this stalker character and then it just turned out to be nothing. That's all got to go in. It's, yeah. it's like you can't. It, it, there are very few people that can be like that. So you could either choose to be realistic about it or else admit that you're just not going to be involved. And for the most part, authors are not like people get surprised yeah. when I say I don't know the status of this. The you know the, the Zoe books has the TV rights to those I sold before the first book was published. They they sold one was still in process. Um, it's still out there. Someone is conceivably still trying to make a show out of it. As far as I know, it's um, that I'm not. I'm not wandering around on set. I'm not in LA. Like it's, that's just not how it works unless you're a superstar author. But even as, as, as Tom said earlier, even some famous ones who you would think would be, would have like producer credits or whatever. Don't it, it's like, right. no, it's, it, they took it. It's like, we're taking it from here. Yep. Yeah. You, at a certain point you have to let go and like hope because there is there's nothing better than the feeling of some some bullshit you put in that actually makes it in even though it costs more that's always great i think about just writing um uh, sketches at cracked where like th there was still this compromise where it's like you need to cut like this many pages off this part it, that you that you wrote that doesn't mean anything you have to get rid of this because it's not the main thesis or whatever and there was no better feeling than like getting a bullshit joke that didn't matter still put in because they like it that much yeah um and that's how it feels like like when uh, like writing this stuff where it's like thinking about budget where it's like what are they willing to pay for? Like, is this worth them paying for? Is it good enough for them to say, oh, yeah, we'll find the money for this? 
or just uh, thinking in terms of like how many people are in a scene that if you've got a character yeah. in a scene and they don't say anything, it's like, well, you, you paid for that person to be there for the day and you just had them sitting at a table. It's like, well, when they actually shoot it, the actor is going to be like, why am I here? Or right. write oh, a yeah. line for me. G- give me something to do. Like I'm an expensive extra. But because if you're just writing a book, who cares? It's you know you yeah, put it anybody, matter. anybody. Uh, you know <laughs> you have as many extras as you want. You can do whatever. But in real life, it's it's like well, no. If this if you depict them, uh, you know, walking across a bridge, we got to find a bridge. And if you depict them walking across a bridge and then they throw something down into the water, we got to now got to find a bridge that's over water that we can shoot on. Uh, right. yeah. Could they have just used a trash can? You know, like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man, we're we're getting in the weeds. <laughs> all right. So all right. Um, all right. Uh, okay. Final thoughts. <laughs> go see this movie. There's there's no reason to to give any more details about it. Go see it. It's extremely well Watch made. It. If you like horror, if you like Lovecrafting horror, if you just like well made horror, like Hereditary, all of the good, a mm-hmm. little bit longer movies with subtext and all of that adult stuff. Go see it. It is called The Empty Man. It is on it is on Amazon Prime. I don't know if it's on Shutter or any of the other. I, who, it's not. I had I to rent know. it. Okay. Um, but it's a rental. It's, it's like five it's bucks. Uh, it, yeah. it, it, we're, you're in a drought of releases. You can't tell me there's other stuff you could be watching. It's <laughs> you, you instead of watching the four hour Snyder Cut, which is fine. Uh, this is <laughs> once once you've watched that. Uh, this is a it's a good thing. This good project to support. I want this guy to make more movies. He has nothing going right now because of the pandemic. That's what he said in the interview. Like he's kind of just in stasis. Uh, I want to make more movies. This is a very capable piece of filmmaking. Um, I'm eager to see what he what he comes up with. Yeah, same. Uh, Jason, thank you so much for show, like telling me about this. Yeah, because. I like yeah this is this is my jam it's like li- like weird uh, uh uh slow burn horror uh like i said this movie gave me an odd comfort throughout where i just felt very like uh, despite it being a horror movie like i just felt very relaxed watching it yeah it's well constructed uh, it's well constructed just if you're a fan of movie making yeah it's it's like i don't know i liked the environments in it uh the rain the the look of it the the, the like the fincher association really makes sense and then it also mm-hmm. just has some truly creepy scenes there's uh, multiple scenes and images that stick in your mind and yes. for horror that oh, is yeah. one of the the iconography and just the moments that stick with you that's one of the great things you can achieve with horror this has multiple moments like that it does it it has uh maybe one maybe two jump scares but the jump scares aren't cheap and they don't i don't i barely I remember them really the things that stick scare, with me yeah. yeah the things that stick with me are the these these really creepy uh i don't know and it's and it's just people it's just dealing with people and images you know it's it's uh yeah. the bridge scene and the cult scene later i don't know it's good yeah check it out people watch this shit yeah. <laughs> um, and then the exercise for the listeners after you've watched the movie, knowing how the title of this movie, The Empty Man, stigmatized it as a bad slasher movie, on your own, think up some better titles for this movie. Yeah. Because obviously that the graphic novels from 2014, when they wrote that, they you know it probably was a very cool title. But knowing that people were going to assume <laughs> it was a sequel to The Bye Bye Man... <laughs> Or whatever. Again, I, I've never seen the Bye Bye Man. I, I we have referenced it thirty seven times this podcast. I don't know why we've chosen that as our whipping I, boy. There's a whole genre of these bad slashers, but I have I started the Bye Bye Man, and that's the that's most review story. I could give. <laughs> I began the movie and I did not finish it. It's what is the Wicker Man? I would say the the remake, the Bye Bye Man, Slender Man. Like it's it really is like a yeah. name issue where yeah. it's like don't do the blank man because we'll just assume it's a bad movie we'll just assume I, it sucks yeah I, I get what they're doing i get that it's a trick but in in today's world where there's so many things to watch that's not good just just <laughs> give it a more yeah. intriguing title uh let people discover it so yeah yeah cool well thank you so much for doing the show jason you, is there anything you want to plug or what do you want to tell people just about? just the book just the book forever until the next <laughs> book is written zoe punches the future in the dick it's it's a title that's fairly easy to remember 
or you can yeah, just uh, type my name into Amazon. And you'll you'll see all of the books there. I've written f- five of them. Yeah, check Damn, it out. You have, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the sixth, the sixth one will be fam- will be finished in about three months. It looks like that is awesome. That's pretty exciting. Yeah, that's dope. Uh, um, Dave, why don't you tell them what we got going on? Yeah, we have we have a Patreon, patreoncom slash unemployed. Uh, there's exclusive podcasts on there for five dollars a month. You can listen to Tom and Jeff watch Batman and Fox Mulder is a maniac. Mm. Uh, two two exclusive podcasts a week. Uh, so I don't know. That's that's a pretty good deal. Uh, every Friday night we watch movies with our patrons. We watched uh, Over the Top, uh, Rad, and, uh, and Rad the Punisher. And <laughs> the Punisher. Yep, we sure this did this last Friday. So you know, if if that speaks to you, uh, check it out. Uh, we also have a store, tbubbuck.com slash store slash Gamefully Employee, where you get t-shirts, masks, mugs, stickers, posters, all kinds of things. Uh, so check that out. Yeah. Any of these things. Yeah. And check out The Empty Man. Yeah, do that. All right. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. What do you, yeah, what do you have to lose? Yeah, what do you folks? got to lose? Two hours and 20 minutes. All, All right. right. Two hours <laughs> and 20 bucks. I mean, come Yeah, on. five bucks. <laughs>